This episode is made possible by our generous patrons. To learn more, visit patreon.com forward slash ink to film. Welcome to the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm Luke. And I'm James. And this week we discuss Neil Gaiman's 2002 novella, Coraline. the world. That's right. I went through a little door in my wall. I'm in a little crazy spot here in my house, and uh, I couldn't help but think that that I've passed into another dimension over here. It's your own personal mirror world, right? Yeah. I call it, was it the other, the other studio? I don't know. Or maybe (laughs) it's, it's actually more like the tunnel between worlds here. Yeah, that's what it is. I I like to think that I'm in this liminal space here, uh, (laughs) commenting on, on awesome works of fantasy. So uh, yeah, this week we're we're doing Coraline, and I'm very excited because I'm a I'm a big Neil Gaiman fan, but I'm also realizing that I haven't read that much of his work. I've read The Ocean at the End of the Lane, and then I've read a bunch of writing about writing that he's done over the years. But I think that's the only, unless I'm forgetting something, I think that's the only thing I've read. I have seen Stardust, which was based off a Neil Gaiman novel, but I I never read it. And then this is my first time reading Coraline, which I had seen the film. But I had never read the novella. How about you? Yeah, I mean, I what's funny is that I could have sworn that I'd read something by Neil Gaiman as well. But I, I hadn't read anything by Neil Gaiman. So this is my first experience uh, actually reading any of his material. But I'm a fan of him in general. Like, I, like I'm like i a fan of the kinds of things that he says on Twitter. I'm a fan of, like, <laughs> like things that I've read of interviews and stuff that he's had. And I always knew that I was a fan of Coraline. So I knew... If it's anything like the like the movie, then then I'm gonna like his work. But yeah, weirdly, I thought that I was a fa- big fan of him, but I hadn't read any of his stuff. <laughs> well, now we can become legit fans instead of just pretenders, right? Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed this. Uh, I think we. I think. I guess we should introduce the podcast for just in case people are checking out for the first time. We talk about books and then, you know, at length, and then we go and we watch the movie that was made off of them and we talk about that at length. Um, For this short novel, we're only going to do one episode. We're going to talk about the whole thing here, and then uh, next week we'll do the movie. So it's just going to be a little two-week two week deal, but uh, it should be a lot of fun. Yeah, I have so much to say about this movie. But yeah. before we get to the movie, let's get into this book because I had a lot more to say about the even the book than I thought I would. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I like I said, would never read this before. I've seen the movie, but I think I saw it when it came out, which I'm not sure what year that was. We'll, we'll figure that out next week, <laughs> unless you know off the top of your head. Yeah, 09. Oh nine. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and I, I, I think I saw it when it came out, and then I haven't seen it since. Mm-hmm. So I actually, as I was reading this book, I'm like, does this happen in the movie? Does this happen? I couldn't remember. You know, it was like, I feel like there's a lot of different stuff, but honestly, I just can't remember. So that'll be something interesting for next week for me to see like what, what was changed and what, you know, what was added and what was, what was taken off. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Do you have any like initial thoughts about how faithful the adaptation was? I think it is very faithful. Um, it's funny because it's been so long for me as well that I, I remembered basically everything except the ending. But I would say, for the most part, I was like, wow, this is like exactly what ended up in the movie. Cool. So I just want to get your general thoughts about the novel. Uh, we're going to get into the plot after. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a bio for, for Neil Gaiman, although not, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth. Um, but before that, I just want to like general thoughts on reading Gaiman for the first time. So I got really into this book, and I was kind of thinking about how much fun it would be to write a children's novel. I, I guess I'd thought of that before, but it's just like you, there's really I mean, there's no rules in, in writing in general, but it just feels like you can do anything. And as long as you are making like deliberate steps to make a point or there's some sort of morality to the tale, then it's all worth it in the end. Um, so I think I, I don't want to call it like a simplistic. I guess it is like the story is like a simplistic structure. But then with the correct writer like game and you're able to add like a lot of detail and tone to it. And it just kind of got me thinking like, I don't know how long it took him to write this novel, but 
it's a fairly short novel and it just seems like a fun thing to have written. So it sounds like you didn't get the same version of the novel as I did. I, mine had like a little forward where it kind of talked about his process of writing it. Um, I, did you listen to the audio book? Yeah, I listened to the audio book. Was uh, how was that? Was that read by Neil Gaiman? Cause yeah, I know it was. he sometimes does. He did. Oh, that's so cool. Okay, so I I didn't get that experience because he's a great reader and and I, if you if you want to check him out, uh, check out Google Neil Gaiman reads Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, mm-hmm. and it was like a stretch goal or something for World Builders. I think last year the Patrick Rothfuss run um, charity, and it's just him sitting in like a like a candlelit room reading The Raven. And it's so good. That's <laughs> like, awesome. I was literally, I was going to say like, he's got a real talent for it. Like I was, oh, no, I was surprised absolutely. at how, how engaging he was. And I was like, he should be a, like a voice actor or like a reader yeah. for audiobooks, but he's a writer. So I guess. So I listened to The Ocean at the End of the Lane on audio um, and he read that as well. So I don't know how many of his novels he narrates, but he does it a lot because he's very good at it. And uh, just as an aside, I, I want to know, like, real No Gaming fans could write us and let us know at, you know, inkdefilm at gmail.com. Um, is there, like, an extended universe for him where, like, everything is connected? Because this novel, An Ocean at the End of the Lane, felt very similar. It felt like Ocean at the End of the Lane was written for a slightly older audience. And is more about, like, an adult remembering or, like, revisiting something that happened in his youth. But... Just the way the like creatures and magic and world was, it's very reminiscent. Uh, I guess Ocean in the Lane is very reminiscent of Coraline because Coraline predates it. Um, so I'm just wondering if that's something that he does, like if there's an extended universe of Neil Gaiman magic and 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 and, and everything. I guess I assume there would be, but um, not all writers do that. And I don't know. I'm I'm interested to find out. I guess as we read more, because I'm sure we'll end up doing more Neil Gaiman in the future. Yeah. I got this, and this is another creator that I just like am completely in love with. I got a lot of Miyazaki from mm. the way that this story plays out and the way that it's so unpredictable but so magical and like surreal feeling. And I felt like the entire time I was like, I could, if it wasn't as creepy as it is, it easily could have been a Miyazaki film. It's funny that you mentioned that because uh, Princess Mononoke, when adapted for English, the person who adapted the screenplay was Neil Gaiman. I think I knew that. I think we did talk about that, yeah. Yeah, I when think we... we might have mentioned that in our House Moving Castle episodes, maybe. Maybe, but, yeah. So that's cool that that connection is there. And I totally agree. And, and honestly, often when I'm writing short stories and stuff or anything, um, I, I will sometimes think about certain authors, not not as like a way to try and emulate them, but more as just a, if they're inspiring the kind of story that I'm writing. And Neil Gaiman was definitely in my head for the for the story that I wrote that was published in Metaphorosis. Um this, you know, Gaiman and Miyazaki both were, were like big inspirations for that particular story. Um, so, yeah, that's that's really cool that you, you, you picked that up because uh, there's there's that connection. So that in that forward, um, I, 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 you know, I don't remember everything that goes on in there, but he, he tells the story of how he grew up in a house in, in, in England where they had a door that opened to a brick wall. And that was like the initial thing that made him think of that. And then later he was writing a story for his first daughter that he began in a house in like England. He was writing a story for her about a little about a little girl, and he initially wrote down the tried to write down the name Caroline, and he screwed it up and wrote down Coraline on accident. Oh, that's funny. And then when he saw the name, he was like, "That's that that character has a story to tell." Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's how that that name came up. And then he didn't finish the novel. He got really busy and he wasn't able to finish it. And then he had another daughter. And he ended up moving, I think, to to the U.S. I forget where in the U.S. But he moved to the U.S. and com- and he and he picked up the novel again when he had another young daughter, and finished it where it was where it was taken off. So in the dedication, I think it says like you know that a novel that was be- began for one daughter and finished for another or something like that or, or their, I can't remember their names. Anyway, so he he wrote this book for his daughters, and then he talked about how. Um, over the years, he's had a lot of women in particular tell him that this novel helped them get through tough times in their life and help them be brave, I guess, in, in situations where they're feeling uh, overwhelmed or frightened by things. And he's found that to be really rewarding. Um, so I don't know. It's just it's really cool. It's it's touching to, to hear. And and um, that combined with the fact that his prose this is kind of a, it's kind of a weird thing to say, but it's true. So uh, certain author's prose is so beautiful that sometimes can bring tears to my eyes when I'm reading it. Mm-hmm. And I was getting that from from 
this not this novel, but then also the forward, just him talking about this, and you could tell how much it has really affected him over the years. And I don't know, I just love that stuff. And and he's he's the kind of author. Another aside, as a writer, I often read authors that I go, "This is great. I think I could do this." And then that's inspiring because I'm like I'm looking at it, and I'm going like, "This is really cool. I think I could pull this off. I'm going to try and do it." And then I read authors like Gaiman, where I go, "This is so simple." And it, but it's so amazing. I don't know how he does it. Right. Like it, it. It seems almost magical to me. I think I got a piece of that. I was like, I was so. I was like, this is such a simple story, but is so outlandish in certain ways and so creative. And it just, it's like oozing this, like, this sense of like creativity. I don't know how else to, to describe yeah. it other than that. And it's just like I. I was thinking like it must be so much fun to just write a kid's not a, like a ch- more geared towards children's novel you have the structure of it being a simple story and that way you can you can really really emphasize the rest of it to like the prose or you know the the specific details and i really hope they uh, adapt ocean at the end of the lane now so that we can cover it on the podcast because i really feel like it's a bookend to this story but uh, before we use up too much time doing about this let's let me let me tell you a little bit about neil gaiman i'm not going to go into a lot of depth but um, he grew up raised by a jewish family that got involved in Scientology, and so he was also raised around Scientology. Um, But he is not one now as he's gotten older, but I guess a lot of his family, extended family, still is involved in the Church of Scientology. Um, He he says he considers God's chance of his existence about 50-50. He said said something funny about, like, if he exists in the DC universe, why why not here? Um, Because apparently he's a big DC fan. (laughs) Um, He said, uh, so when he was a kid, he grew up on Chronicles of Narnia, uh, Alice in Wonderland and the Batman comics, as well as uh, he he could only get the first two copies of Lord of the Rings because that's all his library had. Oh so he re- he reread the first two copies of uh, like Fellowship of the Ring and Two Towers over and over again. And it wasn't until like later on where he he like won a spelling bee or, or a reading competition or something, and he was able to finally get the the Return of the King. That's so um, awesome. That's such a cool story. Yeah, and I, I just like that, too, because those are all... I feel like a lot of that stuff is the same kind of seminal stuff for me that I grew up on. Oh, so I you like just that. Named, yeah, you just named, like, my whole childhood right there. Like, Batman <laughs> comics and, and, you know, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and just the Chronicles of Narnia. But, I, I mean, I what, what I wanted to say is that I also kind of get a lot of, like, Alice in Wonderland, Chronicles of Narnia within this story as well. Sure. I would say more Alice in Wonderland than Chronicles of Narnia, but I definitely see some influence there. Well, both Alice in Wonderland and Chronicles of Narnia are something called portal fantasy, which this definitely is. Mm-hmm. Um, and portal fantasy is a is a terminology describing fantasies in which you you know the main characters travel through a portal into a fantasy world, um, and then that's kind of the whole premise of of it's kind of a delineation between that and like a Lord of the Rings where they're you're just immersed in it, mm-hmm. right? It's a secondary world fantasy. And there is no real world that we know of. Um, but in this one, he, there, the Coraline's in the real world, passes through a portal into this other world. Um, and that's the same thing in Lewis Carroll's, uh, you know, in uh, Alice in Wonderland and Chronicles of Narnia. So, I don't know, there's a nice... Um, he, he definitely wrote this novel, I think, to be of a, of a kind with those. Mm-hmm. He has said that his major influences are Roger Zelazny, who I've read um, The Nine, Nine Princes of Amber... I believe it's the name of the book I read from him. Um, And I can see that. And then his other influences, he says, uh, Moorcock, Ellison, Samuel R. uh, I already said. Oh, no, no. Samuel R. Delaney, Angela Carter, Lafferty, and Le Guin. So I can totally see that. Uh, You know, him and Le Guin are just like yin and yang to me of the same kind of amazing writer. That's another connection to Miyazaki a little bit, right, Earthsea? Yeah. So he's won pretty much every award that you can get, you can win in fiction. Um, so, and I won't list. He's known for he's known for like the Sandman, Good Omens, Stardust, American Gods. So that can show you also the kind of like range of stories he can write. And you know, you know, American Gods is a very adult uh, series, and and then he can write stuff for kids. And I don't know. He's just he's an incredible writer, and there's a lot to look up to there. American Gods is also being adapted as a, as a show, so we could potentially do that at some point if, if there's not. Yeah, I think the second season is coming out or something. I, I don't know. I haven't watched any of it yet, um, because mainly because I, I didn't finish the novel. I've read, I guess I should say that's another experience I've had is I read like half of it, but then I forget. I think I got caught up reading something else, and then it kind of just sat for a long time, and then 
It's one of those things where like you can't pick it up and restart it because you don't remember exactly enough to, that's going on. So I would need to re- restart the novel, but then I kind of haven't done that either. I don't know. Right. Um, so anyway, I need to go back to that. And then because of that, I also haven't been watching the show because I kind of wanted to go read the novel first. Mm-hmm. So that's just been kind of like on hold for me. <laughs> All right, man. I think we should get into the plot itself. I think what I want to do is I'm going to give like a brief plot summary in quarters and we can respond to each quarter roughly. And you can tell me like kind of what, you know, we could talk about what we felt. That sounds good. Coraline Jones and her parents move into an old house divided into flats. The other tenants include Miss Spink and Miss Forcible, two elderly women retired from the stage, and Mr. Bobo, initially referred to as the crazy old man upstairs, who claims to be training a mouse circus. The flat beside Coraline's is unoccupied, and a small door that links them is revealed to be bricked up when opened. Mr. Bobo relays a message to her, to her from his mice. Don't go through the door. Coraline has tea with Miss Spink and Miss Forcible, and Miss Spink spies danger in Coraline's future after reading her tea, tea leaves. She then gives her a lucky stone with a hole in the middle, which she is which is supposed to be good for bad things. So I thought we'd just stop here and talk about the major players, the different characters, like what you thought of them and kind of your initial uh or our initial introduction to this world. I have to say that everything in the book is informed by the film for me. So like a lot of the visual stuff when I'm imagining it for the book, I just can't detach it from from that beautiful film i don't know i think i think it's interesting because we get this this girl who feels ignored by everyone around her and i think that's kind of like her major call i wouldn't say call to action but like her her reason to go venture out and be this adventurer and i also wanted to say that i love Coraline as a character that's the kind of character that i've always looked up to in a, an adventure story and and it just pulls you right in and makes you feel like that's you and that's what you want to strive to be yeah, she he does a great job characterizing her early. And I was noticing because that's something that's been on my mind a lot uh, with my own novel. So I'm, I've been thinking a lot about characterization, and, and he does it so well. We see Coraline doing little things that informs us who she is. Uh, she subtly corrects adults repeatedly when they get her name wrong. Um, she shows that she... And so in doing that, to me, it shows that she believes in getting things right and that she's willing to stand up to an authority figure. Um, she's also clearly smart. She's, she's, she's adventurous. We see her exploring the garden and, um, I love the bit where it was like, uh, she, she was told that the well was dangerous and to stay away from it. So she's like, well, I need to go investigate it so I can know where it is so I can stay away from it. (laughs) Right. This is like, this is really the kind of person I felt like, uh, this is the kind of childhood I feel like I led was like very much exploring and so curious and like maybe potentially getting myself into danger sometimes, but not quite, you know, I wasn't like a bad kid. I was just always trying to like push the envelope a little bit. I think the first step that Gaiman made after realizing that Coraline was going to be the name was saying people, the characters are going to get her name wrong. They're going to say Caroline instead of Coraline. And that's going to be like a major reason why she's feeling like forgotten or like overlooked. Misunderstood. Yeah, and and he does a lot with his prose to create a kind of a fairy tale feel. I noticed, um, and this is kind of a deep cut writer thing, but I noticed that the way he was phrasing things, he was doing it a lot in a way that we're told not to do it. There was a whole paragraph, and I didn't write it down verbatim, but he basically begins every sentence with "there was," "it was," "there was also." So he's like, "there was a door," there, you know what I mean? Like he's he's listing it, and we're often told to cut excess words. And that that's a very passive phrasing. The word was is like you should try and use as little as possible. But um, this is just an example of where writing rules are, you know, while often have good meanings and have a good reason to be a quote unquote rule that in the hands of a master like Gaiman, he can use them. He can do things deliberately Um, and that and that I think all writers can. Um, You just have to make sure you're doing it deliberately and it's not just an accident. And for him, I think it's because he's creating a fairy tale like feel for this novel. And when in saying that, to me, it's like this slightly omniscient sounding narrator telling us about Cor- telling us the tale of Coraline, and it's kind of this fairy tale. I right. don't know. It almost pushes it into like this, like like a legend or like a myth, where it's yeah. like this is how it was. Period. 
I like to see, I mean, there are filmmakers like this too. There's clear rules and it's like, you don't break the 180 rule. And then- Wait, wait, so you gotta tell me what the 180 rule is Okay, so it's basically while you're filming, if you're not aware of of the line, you are going to end up into a situ- in a situation where you have basically what looks like a jump cut or something too jarring for the audience. So if you had a shot of a person sitting and then you went like over their shoulder, a shot from straight on, and then you went like over their shoulder to show something like out the window or something like that. So it would be like one shot to the next shot. It would be too jarring for the because you lose your sense of space within the scene. Oh, I see. I see. It's like too disconnected from what you would just what you just saw. Okay, I, I think I, I think I get what you're coming from. But be, be, look up the 180 rule if you're if you're curious about this. I'm doing a really <laughs> bad job of explaining it. But basically, okay. uh, there's like I, I can't even think of what film it is right now. But there's there's a um, Japanese film that very famously breaks the 180 rule like throughout this scene. Where, like I said, they're just sitting at this table eating, basically, and it continually cuts and cuts and cuts, and it's done deliberately to make you feel off-put or make you feel like on your back foot, kind of thing. I'm gonna want to. I'm gonna want to revisit that when we do The Shining, mm-hmm. because I've always heard that there's all kinds of like camera tricks that is done in that film to make you feel like unsettled and like you don't know where you are. And I'm wondering if that's one of the effects that Kubrick uses. Uh, there's so you want to, that's the master. Like that's like getting into like the, the full on master. Like there's, there's plenty of techniques in, in the shining, like his use cool. of colors and space and patterns and symmetry. And, and like it's, it's wild. Cool. Uh, all right. So let's, let's, let's get on a little bit here. I love that. She says, I don't like recipes, which I thought was so perfect. Cause it's, not only do I understand it as a kid, because it's like you like simple flavors when you're a kid, right? Like you like simple foods. Just give me pizza. Give me, give me, you know what I mean? Like you, you don't want anything too complicated. But then I also, as I'm older now, I'm not a parent, but even as just because I'm older now, I can feel like how infuriating that would be as a parent because it like recipes doesn't mean anything. It's just like anything that you've put any effort into, I don't want. And that would be so infuriating. <laughs> But it's also perfect for her, right? Like it fits her character too, though. I don't know. Yeah, it's funny because the parents, um, what a child perceives, is so much different than what's actually going on for the parent. And like being an adult now, and and thinking about you know a kid running up and you're trying to get something done for work or something, and and interrupting you. Like what happens with the the, the father? I don't know. It's just fun because books like this make you think. Like as an adult, you should still strive to kind of understand or at least be a child in some way. And especially like within as an adult, just to remember what it was like to be a kid, especially if you're going to try and write a novel from a kid's perspective, right? Like you have to be able to put yourself in that mindset. And I love the idea of her exploring her own little world and finding all this, all these little things, you know, she finds the, the, the fairy circle and she finds the well and she finds, you know, all these little things that I think adults don't like don't care about or wouldn't pay attention to. Mm hmm. And and that you know obviously that leads up to her finding the door. So this 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 book is also very well crafted, and like everything is leading like her being an explorer sets up her finding the door and being curious about it and being willing to go through it. Um, so I, I love the way that all works together. I did want to uh, call out um, a, a thing that I liked here. It was like a, I thought it was like a little Easter egg. Um, the 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 old women tell her that she's in terrible danger when they read her tea leaves. And then she says, well, what can I do about it? And one of them says, don't wear green in the dressing room or mention the Scottish play. And do you, do you know what this refers to? I don't know. Okay, so this, I, I, knew, but I knew what the Scottish play was, but I didn't know about the green one, so I looked it up. So the Scottish play is Macbeth, and it's apparently a really big no-no to mention the name Macbeth or any lines from, from the play Macbeth if you're in theater um, while you're like... Like uh, in the dressing room or any in that area, like in, inside the theater itself, it's it's considered really bad luck. Um, and I the read the legend has it that the original actor who was going to play Macbeth died right before the play started, and that Shakespeare had to take on the role himself. Um, but a lot of people think it's apocryphal, and it actually never happened. Right. But for whatever reason, it's 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 gone on to become this big thing where you're not ever supposed to mention Macbeth, and so instead you say the Scottish play if you want to refer to it. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a cool detail. Yeah, and green is also another one. This is another this is another theater specific um, superstition, and this comes back to basically you're not supposed to ever wear green when you're in the green room, um, and or like or around around that area in general. 
And, it, and from what I could tell, it's because traditionally the devil, like any character that was supposed to be a de demon or that represent the devil would wear green in a lot of these like older traditional plays. And so it became sort of uh, the color associated with the devil. And so you, you're not supposed to wear green. So anyway, I just love that they, they throw out both of these things. And like as a kid reading this novel, you have no idea what they're talking about. And, and Coraline has no idea what, what they're talking about. But I like that if you're an adult who happens to know about these things, it's a cool little Easter egg for like um, understanding what their background is in, right? Yeah. And what they're talking about and how they're they're kind of just joking about it, like the superstition, like they don't take it too seriously. I, that's awesome, man. I'm really glad that you said that because I didn't think anything of it. I was like, oh, it's probably some just something from wherever they're from, whatever country they're from. And I just yeah. kind of overlooked it just like a kid would. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, speaking of that, so the rock with the hole in it, this is an actual thing. Do you know anything about these, these, these little rocks? I don't know. I mean, I feel like so it's like, it's become like a, Something that I've seen in movies and stuff, but I don't think it's really. Uh, you probably have. I don't know, yeah, like the, it, the initial, you know, whatever it's yeah. referencing or whatever. Yeah. So this is what's called an adder stone, from what I could find out, um, which apparently refers to the the. It's basically supposed to have been formed by like snakes twining together, although I don't know how it turns into a rock. Couldn't really quite put that together, but it's an adder stone. Um, and for it to be a true adder stone, it has to be formed naturally. It can't be man-made, so you can't just, like, make one. So you have to find a rock with a hole in the middle. And the whole point of it is, it's, is it gives you, like, this supernatural sight, the true sight. And it's supposed to be able to be used to see through the disguises of fairies and witches. That's and cool. so this is like a real thing, like, in, in like, you know, that sort of Gaelic and, and like, um, uh, European mythology. And Gaiman has, you know, lifted it and used it in his novella here. It's not like it's, this is completely invented. Um, he never calls it an adder stone, but it, that's what it is. Um, and then uh, later we we, we we find that the other mother is called a, a Beldam, which I looked up as well. And apparently... That was a Beldame. Did he pronounce it Beldame? Maybe he, he might have pronounced it in the audio book that I, way. I think he did. I don't know. I don't know how it's pronounced, but um, it is also a real word, and it's basically for, like, an, an old witch. <laughs> gotcha. Um, and it's, like, an archaic term. Now, are these all basically from the same culture, or are they just from different... You know, is it all, like, Gaelic, yeah, European? Yeah, I think, I think it, oh, it might be Welsh, too. I'm not really 100% sure on that. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I, I don't know if that's from different from different cultures or not. That's a good question. But I, I'm not versed in it enough to tell you the answer to that. So I just want—I mean, just, I wanted to call out a couple of lines that I really loved um, here and there. I'm, gonna, I'm going to, but there's one here that that, that caught me. Um, he said the mist hung like blindness around the house, and this is my example of how simple his prose is, but how wonderful it can be <laughs> because it's it's just a surprising comparison to make, and um, it almost doesn't work. But then it does, and and that like that little narrow like it's a very high level of difficulty, and so I think the payoff is that much better because you can look at it and go like that almost didn't make sense, but yet it does, mm -hmm. and so to me at least it really delivered. There was one I I have one line or not even a line okay. but a, a description that kind of sticks with is sticking with me and and I think will for a long time is the way that he kept saying the cat would always have its its tail and like a question mark. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that fit this story so well. I was like, that is, that's such a great detail that I think I've never really thought of before. That's like so perfect. So Coraline decides to unlock the door when she is home by herself. This time, a long hallway instead of bricks leads to a flat identical to her own, except it's inhabited by the other mother and other father who have black buttons for eyes. The other mother, mother is notably taller and thinner. Her black hair seems to move by itself, her skin is paper white, and her nails are long and red. Coraline finds the other world more interesting than her own, and the other mother cooks food she actually enjoys. Both of her other parents pay more attention to her. The other Miss Spink and Miss Forceful perform a never-ending act in their flat, and the other Mr. Bobo performs a, a mice circus. She even finds that the black cat that wanders through the house in the, in the real world can talk. The cat possesses the ability to travel through the gaps between the two worlds. The other mother offers Coraline the opportunity to stay in the other world forever, but in order to do so, Coraline must allow buttons to be sewn into her eyes. Coraline is horrified and returns through the door to her home. She finds that her real parents are missing. 
They do not return the next day, and the cat wakes her to take her to a mirror in the hallway, through which she can see her trapped parents. They write, help us, on the glass. Coraline goes back to the other world to rescue her parents. In the garden, she is prompted by the cat to challenge the other mother, as her kind love games and challenges. The other mother tries to convince Coraline to stay, but Coraline refuses, and is locked in a small space behind a mirror as punishment. So cover a lot of ground there, but... Mm-hmm. Um, this is like her initial, her initial, her initial trip into the other mother or into the other world to, to meet the other mother. Yeah. Like what, what did you think of that? The first thing that, that strikes me is these characters. And I, I wanted to ask you because there's not very many characters in, in this story. So I wanted to ask you like their significance and do you, I mean, I feel like we've already kind of touched on it a little bit, but do you, you this is, there's definitely more to this story than just a fairy tale. It's not just like a surface level kid's story. There's, there's references being made and, and, um, you know, little Easter eggs here and there. What did you make of, first of all, the mice? And then also, I guess we're not too, we're not far enough yet to talk about the dogs, but the mice and the dogs and the kind of the ways that they act in the real world and in the other world. And also like, what, how is that associated with the characters that own them? I just feel like there's a lot to talk about there. Like the, for me, the rats, because there's rats that are running around and singing and being all ominous and then there's the rats in the real world that are like the tri- they're learning a circus act. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like some things and a lot of, uh, a lot of things are this kind of like twisted, dark version. The other mother is the only real being other than the cat. It seems like in that other world, and she's kind of made everything. We find out mm-hmm. she's she's spun it together, um, created it for Coraline specifically. And yeah, the, the, the creatures and the dogs, and I, like, I love the detail where the, where, I mean, later we haven't found the dogs yet, but where we find that the dogs can only eat chocolate in this world versus, you know, in our world can't eat chocolate because it's poisonous. So I love like the little details like that to show you how this world is like wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the mice are super creepy. I love that they speak with one voice and and make little rhymes and stuff. Like it's, it's, it's perfect for a child, for a children's novel. But then it's also um, it's also super creepy. So that that reminds me of something else I wanted to say. Um, I wish I this novel could have been written in 1992 instead of 2002, because I think a young Luke would have absolutely loved this novel. I was so into stories like this. I was really into like being creeped out when I was young. Mm-hmm. I used to read all kinds of scary scary novels and scary stories. Um, other than fantasy, that was my main thing. It was a lot of like horror. And ghost stories and stories about children facing monsters. I love that stuff. And this would have been perfect for me. But I think what happened was it was written when I was 17. And at that point, I was starting to already be like, I don't read anything that's meant for kids. Like, I didn't read Harry Potter. We talked about this because Mm -hmm. it was too childish for me. Like, I was very into uh, now I read adult stuff by the time I was that age. So I missed this novel, you know, and I think that's why I never read it. Um, so yeah, I just wish it's, it's like unfortunate cause it just fell at a time in which I wasn't into that sort of, this sort of thing anymore, but I wish I had been able to, cause I think I would have really loved it. Yeah, I agree. There's a, there's a common link between the stuff that I'm going to talk about right now. Growing up, did you watch James and the Giant Peach? Yes. And like Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah. And Coraline. These, these kind of the tone and like the darkness and it, it is a kid's story, but it is, it goes creepy and it, it like there's, there's allowed to be, it's not just a fairy tale where everything's happy the whole time. And the worst yeah. thing that happens is somebody's kidnapped or something. Um, like there's like genuine creepiness and danger going on. Oh, and in my, so another thing you didn't get by not reading the book is there are some amazing illustrations. Now I have like the 10th anniversary edition and it mm-hmm. has these illustrations. I don't know if all the versions have this, but there's some really creepy like black and white illustrations throughout this novel. And I should post some of By Gaiman? Po- I, no, they're by a different illustrator. Okay. I'll post a few of them to, to Instagram maybe when I uh when when I when I talk about this. Um it's it's really I don't know, it's really it's, some of it was really creepy and like I I love that kind of stuff too. Like I was a big fan of uh scary stories to tell in the dark mm-hmm. because of those illustrations. We're just so I gotta ask you this real quick. Nightmare did, inducing. Did you watch the show um Are You Afraid of the Dark? Yes. Oh my god, dude! I was just talking about this show <laughs> to somebody, and I was just like, "That that show is awesome." Growing up. Yep. Cool. So, uh, sorry. The the movies that I mentioned, uh, James and Giant Peach, Nightmare Before Christmas, they were all directed by this guy Henry Selick, and um, he's he's a legend, and specifically a stop motion legend. And once we get to the films, I'll talk more about it. 
I did want to talk about the cat a little bit here, this talking cat. This is another thing. Now, I don't know if in 2002 if this is as much of a cliche, cliche as it is now. In fact, this probably is part of the thing that solidified it as a cliche. But this is a big no-no now. They tell you don't write little talking animals, <laughs> especially cats and dogs. Um, it's considered, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's been done to death essentially. Um, and because of that, I was a little bit against this cat from the initial, from the go. In, in fact, what, there's one part where, I, you know, I've given, I'm heaped all this praise on him. I have to call him out on something that I found to be kind of a groaner. Um, he, the cat says something and then, and then he says it added cattily. And I just found that to like be a step too far into like that kind of playful, like, pun or like it's a, it's a it's a pun it's like a dad joke right. almost but is it there i think it's almost there for the kids right like if a kid no no yeah and i think as a kid you that. probably you probably love it but as an yeah. adult re, like writer i just looked at that i was like ah it kind of made me groan yeah um, I can so see that. There, it's not like everything works perfectly for me in fact i think um as an adult i think you might enjoy something like um ocean at the end of the lane a little more i don't know maybe not though a lot of you know people like different things um this is definitely a classic so it's been a little while since we've talked about Audible, uh, but you talking about Neil Gaiman narrating this made me think of it. We sh- uh, if you want to get this book, uh, you can sign up for Audible using our affiliate link, audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film, and you can get this book for free and he- hear Neil Gaiman read this to you um, or The Ocean at the End of the Lane or many of his other novels are on there. Yeah, I highly recommend it as well. Um, I didn't expect to like the audiobook as much as, as I ended up liking it and i didn't know gaiman narrated it until i was actually listening to it and they said his name uh he just absolutely crushed it he just like i i did not know that he had such a talent for for voice narrating yeah he's amazing um and if you don't know audible is an app you can get on your phone uh you listen to it just like you listen to a podcast uh i love audiobooks because i can use them while i multitask i can take notes or i can do dishes or i can walk the dog um, so if you like podcasts, you should definitely check out Audible. And once again, that link is audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film. They have like 80,000 plus titles on there. Anything you, you could want is basically on there. So check it out. So inside the dark closet where she's been locked, she meets three ghost children. Each had in the past let the other mother, who they refer to as the Beldum, sew, sew buttons over their eyes. They tell Coraline how the other mother grew bored with them and cast them aside, but they are trapped there because she has kept their souls. The ghost children implore Coraline to escape and avoid their fate. After the other mother releases Coraline from the mirror, Coraline proposes a game. If she can find the ghost children's souls and her parents, then she and and the children may all go free. If she loses, then Coraline will let the other mother sew buttons over her eyes and become a loving loving daughter to her. The other mother agrees. Coraline searches the other world and using her wits and Mrs. Spink's lucky stone is able to find the marble-like souls. She also deduces that her parents are imprisoned in a snow globe on the mantelpiece. I want to stop here and talk about this search and this uh, and the ch- and the ghost children and and all of that. Like what did, what did you think of this whole thing? I I mean I I really liked it. Did did we get to the point now where she has found any of them or not yet? Well, yeah. I mean we're talking about this whole section. Okay, so yeah, so, she finds so them here. I I like the idea and it almost feels like gamifying it a little bit where it's like it's like level one, go get this marble, level two. Go, and I, I, it's something that seems simple, but I, I enjoy uh, for this story. I feel like in another story I wouldn't. But um, I liked that because it was it was her adventure and she was going in and solving each of these puzzles in order to beat the Beldum. The thing I was going to ask you about with the dogs is do because they're talking about i i read this crazy thing i don't want to claim this is my own some people were saying that the mice and the dogs are like dead versions of the mice and the dogs and the reason that the dogs are talking about eating chocolate is because they like like specifically whichever one was talking about eating chocolate like died or they have died and then seeing the dogs be like bats slash dogs and hanging from the ceiling I just thought I just thought that there was something to that a little bit. Like I felt like I I don't know if that's a true. I feel like it's just a theory. But, but well, I think the text does support that kind of thinking because there's a couple times I'm remembering where she mentions she'll be looking at a character and she'll think of a of a of, of a dead in or somebody speaks with a dead insect's voice and she goes yeah. I don't know why I would think of a dead insect speaking but that's what it sounds like to me 
And so, yeah, I like that. And I think that that is supported the idea that like these, these things are like cop, like living copies of dead things. Mm -hmm. I like that actually. And and I can can totally see that. Also, I had this question, which brings me to the cat. When she's first, when the cat is first introduced, she, she, and it's speaking, she says, she describes it as her own voice, but if it was a man's voice, do you remember that? I don't remember that. And she I, she I basically says like it's like it's it's like basically sounded like me, like me talking, but uh had like a man's voice and I was wondering if there was some because the the cat is so connected to Coraline is there something there with Coraline and like her otherworldly self or some sort of like cuz the cat wasn't wasn't um a Beldum creation, right? No, no, the cat and and and, I don't, and she it's an open question. Are all cats like this or is it just this cat? Um, but no, it's uh, he's able to cross between the worlds. He's one of the only beings that can right. that can slip in and out of the other world, and he's aware of what this this old thing is, and and he knows he knows a lot. And I love how sarcastic he is with her. Um, I, that was the thing that kind of won me over. Is he's like kind of he's kind of like mean to her almost a bunch of the times, and, yeah. and dismissive and and just haughty. And like I love that. It's like a per- pers- It's a perfect personality for a cat to have. Um, so I, I don't know. It was winning to me. This is written from somebody who just loves cats. I, I bet you Neil Gaiman is a huge cat lover. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I thought he was just having fun there, but I, I do like the idea that maybe Coraline is kind of like that as well. Like she's a human version of that and that she, she sees beyond. Right. Um, and this is a big theme with a lot of, we've talked about with like Stephen King and a lot of people who write these stories about children who, we, you know, Stranger Things is an example of this, where, like, children are able to believe more quickly than he, than adults do, and so are often able to tap into the supernatural, like, more directly and accept it as a thing. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what makes Stranger Things work so strongly. And I think that's true for Coraline as well. Like, she doesn't really... We rarely see her surprised by things, right? Like she's she often just kind of takes it, like, "Yep, this is this is." I went through a portal and I'm in another world, and here's the other mother, and she's kind of creepy. But Definitely. we don't get a lot of her going like, "How is this possible? This doesn't make any sense. This isn't how reality works." Instead, she just accepts it. She's very British. Like I felt, I felt be like I knew Gaiman was br- British, but I didn't really. Um, I mean, I hadn't read anything by him, so I didn't really know if there was a sense of that in his writing. But yeah. some of the ways that she talks. Um, there's well, one... you get you get in game and reading it to you, so it's probably uh, that's even stronger there. <laughs> but there was a mo- like there. She talks about like having tea at one point and and like the certain very British things. But there was one moment when like something happened and she took it in stride. And the way that Gaiman delivered the line also was just very. It just felt very British, very okay. like stiff upper lip. Well, he 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 grew up in Britain. I, I think he has spent time in America. I think he he might live in both countries off and on. I don't really know. Um, but yeah, I mean, that makes sense. <laughs> um, I, so the other thing, the other father, um, I think is a really clever character for, for, for a couple reasons. I, I love the idea of when he's this big grub thing that chases her around the room and she has to like outsmart and blind, he's really creepy. He's really effective. And then I love the way Coraline, uh, sorry, Neil Gaiman uses Coraline to soften it still. I thought he did this throughout. He softens the, the the fear factor because I felt like this novel could have been written in such a way that it was much scarier than it is. And one of the ways he's able to do that is he makes Coraline always feel sorry for things. So she, she, she like looks at the other father and feels sorry for him that he's been trapped mm-hmm. and, Oh, look at this pathetic creature and look at what she's done to you. Um, whereas I think he, she could have, he could have written it so that she was terrified of all this stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. But instead of her being terrified, she's, we see her being brave constantly. And so I felt like that took this novel from being p- potentially too frightening for children for being like just the right amount of frightening. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> I actually love the, the bravery part of it because I think that that's like a, a great lesson for, for kids there as well. And, and an inspiration to, like be adventurous because you could see a, a character in a children's novel just running away from a monster like this but instead she she's brave enough to like see and feel and then in turn feel sorry for something that scares her so i just think i think that's really cool i, I do love there's a line um which she so she's back in the real world and her mothers have just gone missing her parents have just gone missing and she goes to forcible and spink and she says, you know, my parents are gone. They've disappeared. They've disappeared mysteriously. And then she says, I think I've probably become a single child family. 
And that made me laugh out loud because it's like, it's a perfect little child thing where of like not really understanding what that term means. And she doesn't mean like, I am now a, a, the lone child of parent. Like, you know what I mean? Like that, that's what I, I would think a single child family means. She means it of like, I am a family of one now. <laughs> it is yeah. just me. I am a single child family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I thought was just, I, I don't know, really humorous. The conversation with the, the cop over the phone was pretty funny too. Oh yeah, that was so good. How like, She's so serious, but the things she's saying are just so ridiculous. And so you love how he just kind of like humors her. Yeah, that and, and that mirrors so many other like things like that I've seen over the years. But this one in particular stood out as being almost charming. Oh, another description here. Um, I can't remember what it was she's talking about. Maybe somebody's, I don't know, I don't remember. Um, but she says something is as dry as a dead fly on a windowsill in winter. And... Uh, God, that's such a weird descriptor, but it works, and it's and it's got wordplay, and it's it, and it rhymes. It's got internal rhyme. It's like a little bit little bit of poetry, and you know, Gaiman has a background as in po- in poetry, so it totally makes sense. So, what did you? I don't think I, you said. Uh, what did you think about the kids, uh, like the spirits and the quests that she goes on? And I, I see. I couldn't remember this part from the from the sh- movie, but it probably is in there. Um, it was interesting and I, I, and I like that it's like, it adds, she's not, it adds another layer. She's not just saving the parents who she has endangered through what she's done by opening the door. It adds another layer where she can actually save some other people or other souls. And so it makes what she's done even more heroic. Um, so it, there's a lot of subtle things Gaiman does here to make sure this story is playing the exact way he wants it to play, right? Like, this isn't a story... This isn't a cautionary tale about being over-adventurous. And in fact, it's the opposite of that, right? Like, it's it's mm. celebrating that. And so she's able to save some souls through this. Um, and just that little difference, like, if it hadn't been for them and she was just saving her parents, then it would be a different sort of story because she's the one who opened the door in the first place. So you could almost see it as a cautionary tale, but then, but this little change makes it so it's not. So I really like that. What about you? What did you think of them? I mean, it's also they're also like I love the way he describes them. It's very creepy, and like I said, it's almost frightening. But she immediately feels sorry for them, and that softens it. The idea of her being in this little closet, trapped with them, like I found very claustrophobic at first, right? And she couldn't see them, and it's just voices whispering. Uh, and I like that the the item became became relevant and and there, she's able to like seek these things out in the other the i also like the way that the the other world looks through the lens of this this little eye thing but i guess that's a, that's about to happen that hasn't really happened yet in the well and then we should also talk i mean this is throughout the novel i love the way the world starts to become less and less real yes and at first it's very bribe vibrant but then it starts to look like at one point it becomes like it looks like a picture of a house mm-hmm. and then the house becomes like a drawing of a house and so it's, it's just, I love the way things are deteriorating. And then um, when she goes out exploring, she sees things that look like the idea of a tree that, I instead love that of part. a tree. Like that there's so, so many cool. cool little, I mean, like it's so simply written, but it's so evocative, right? Right. Very, very cool. And yeah, I love the idea of this creature who's like created this little pocket dimension and feeds on children and, and feeds on souls and has this fake love too, and I think that thematically is probably a big a big point here. I think Gaiman's trying to make right about like people who profess to love you, but actually just want something from you. Mm-hmm. And I think that's like this is I mean like obviously this is a monster, but I think you could extrapolate it out to be about people. You know, you might you might meet, um, and whether they're preying on you in a criminal sort of way or wherever, it, or it's just somebody you know socially who who pretends to be your friend and actually, mm-hmm. you know, just wants something from you. I think there you can find something there for both both scenarios, right? Yeah, I think the idea that like the perfection and everything seems so much better when she first gets there is kind of enticing, and you could see how you know this this creature preys on children who are having issues with their parents or whatever. And you could see how a child would would say, like, this is way better than my existence that I have right now. And it's kind of that lesson of of thinking, like, just because things seem perfect, it might just be a surface level thing. And saying your parents yeah. love you is a, it's kind of a, you know, an obvious thing. But your parents love you and whether, whether it's an easy time or a hard time. Yeah. And man, I like how he, uh, the buttons for eyes things is it was something I thought was very weird when I saw the movie, but it makes such sense the more I think about it because she the Beldum makes everything, right? But she can't she can't make eyes that are convincing. And instead she just does buttons. 
And that all goes back to what we talked about with like the eyes being the window to the soul, you know, that, that whole thing. And how I think Game is trying to say like the true intent of a person that you can see through their eyes, you can't fake. Mm-hmm. And so instead you, they have these button eyes that are flat and like lifeless and creepy. And as soon as Coraline can't come around on the button eyes, she starts to like notice more and more things being off. But it's the button eyes that are the main, that's the main like giveaway that like things are wrong in this world. So I did want to bring up one other thing, and this kind of gets into like other projects we've covered and is a bit heady for a ch- children's novel. But I love the idea when she talks, she's talking to Mr. Bobo, they're the other Mr. Bobo. And he he says, you know, if you stay here in this world, this is when she's looking for her parents or for the final soul. And he says, if you stay here in this world, you can have anything you want. She'll make it for you. And she says, I don't want I don't want everything I want. Nobody does. Um, and essentially says she wouldn't be happy here unless because she thinks about the things that made her unhappy in the real world. And she kind of desires them. So I think that's also like, that's a good thing for children to think about. Right. The the things that you think were making you unhappy being worthwhile. But this raised a bigger question for me as an adult who thinks who's thought about this sort of stuff when it when it comes to the singularity and um, the, you know, technological singularity Mm -hmm. and the concept that I've heard, you know, put out that like humans are going to be able through technology to create sort of a paradise, like an like an artificial paradise to live in where you can do anything and have anything and it can every you know wish you could ever have can be fulfilled and desire and all this stuff right and this reminded me a little bit of that and like that's there's kind of a there is also sort of an emptiness when you think about that oh absolutely yeah i mean and and i love that this sort of touches on that i just wanted to get your your thoughts on that sort of thing yeah i'm a big it's it's a cliche but i'm a big supporter of the idea that it really it's about the journey and not the destination I think that's part of life is is kind of just striving towards something. I think we see it with some people who are able to attain everything. If you if you become like insanely rich overnight, like you see it with like people who win the lottery, you you end up in a situation where you have everything but you don't feel fulfilled and I think it's about having a drive or having a goal and just like striving for it and and grinding for it and I think that's a definitely a great lesson for kids. Yeah, there like, like there needs to be resistance, right? Like you can't it's like um you think about a video game, like as soon as you enter god mode and you enter all in all these like cheats, it's fun for a little bit, but then now all of a sudden the game's not fun anymore. Right. And and I like, I told that's totally true. It's like cheating in, in any game. Like if you start cheating um to get ahead, like the game will lose its fun quickly. Um and I don't know, it's interesting. I think it is I think it is a challenge as we move forward with these technologies that we have to think about um and then the other thing that reminded me of is this is one of the reasons why I always found the concept of heaven to be a little bit unappealing, <laughs> which it might which might sound weird. Yeah. But but um, you, whenever the, I've heard heaven described as a place where everything is, you know, everything is good and feels great and and you know everything you could ever want and desire is there and it's just a place of unending happiness, I can't help but feel like that sounds a little bit boring to me. Um, to me, heaven is more like, I don't know, like, I, I think that's why, you know, someone who believes in sort of like an ex- existentialist thought that the life you're living now with all its hardship and on complexity and, and challenge is actually the highest form of, of existence and the highest form of reality that we should strive for. Um, so that's why I always feel like instead of pining for this, you know, potentially you know, uh, mythical or fictional uh, place where everything is perfect forever um, to like live in the now and appreciate the reality you're in with with its positives and negatives and and, and the challenges that presents. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm going off on a tangent here, but I, I, I it's like I'm not going to say that I subscribe to this or anything, but I would say that the idea of a perfect heaven would if it's perfect it would be perfectly tailored to you so if if you're the kind of person who would need that kind of struggle or something to that resistance maybe that heaven would include that well wouldn't wouldn't couldn't you say the same thing about constructed paradises then too though like it's like it's like building a game you can build a game with difficulty right well that's why we have but that's why you have fun playing a game it's like yeah so if if in a a world in a post-singularity world where we can create our own paradises 
we could also build in difficulty. Right. Right. And I think that would so, be more, I think that that would, so I don't does that, that go against it. the purpose of this story to say that, you know what I mean? Like a created reality isn't as good. Are we, are we saying that that's maybe not true? I mean, yeah, but <laughs> we're, we've gone down a rabbit hole. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't know how much of this stuff really applies to Coraline, but it, it came up. It came up in that conversation for me because it's something I think about a lot, and I think it's a very interesting question. Mm-hmm. I don't know the answer to it honestly, right? Um, but it is something I think it's it's fun to think about. But let's move on in the story here. Coraline tricks the other mother by announcing that she knows where her parents are hidden in the passageway between the worlds. The other mother cannot resist gloating by opening the door to show her that her parents are not there. When she does open the door, Coraline throws the cat at her grabs the snow globe, and escapes into the real world with the key. While escaping, Coraline forces the door shut on the other mother's hand. Back in her home, Coraline falls asleep on a chair. She is awoken by her parents who have no memory of the events. That night, Coraline has a dream in which she meets the three children at a, p- at a picnic. They warn her that her task is still not done. The other mother will attempt to come back and will try and get the key to open the door between the worlds. Coraline goes to the old well in the woods to dispose of the key. She pretends to have a picnic, with the picnic blanket laid over the entrance to the well. The other mother's severed hand attempts to seize the key, but steps on the blanket and falls into the well. Coraline returns to the house, greeting her na- greeting with her neighbors, who finally get her name right, and getting ready for school tomorrow. And that's the end of the novel. So let's, let's talk. Let's talk about this this final climax here. I got quick thoughts for you. So I love. First of all, I love the the planning and the scheming that Coraline has throughout, like yeah. the the tricking of the of the other mother to open the door and and although throwing the cat does seem kind of fucked up because that's your buddy. It's been your familiar this whole time. <laughs> I loved it though. It was so funny. Like and and. She apologizes to him later, right? right. Um, but I love that she just he sustains the cat. an injury too because of her. <laughs> she just chucks the cat at the, at the other mother. He's all and I, up. I love that the cat just freaks out and starts scratching her face and everything. Mm-hmm. And then also the the scheme or the plan at the end where she has the picnic the picnic set up, uh, and the way that it was written, uh, you're kind of putting the pieces together. And and for a children's novel, it was like I wasn't quite expecting. I knew that the well was going to be relevant, and I don't remember. I think this this I don't know how much of this ending is in the movie. I, I don't really remember, yeah. like I said, but uh, I did love that plan where she had it all set up. But I was thinking, like she had like very she had very light things holding the corners of the of the picnic cloth. It was like water jugs, so we don't know how heavy they are. Yeah, I'm hoping. Yeah. Like I, I don't know. I was like, damn, if a breeze rolls by, you're gonna lose your whole your whole <laughs> deal here. Yeah. I did. I did th- like that the story returns to the garden. There's a certain um, symmetry there. Like we begin with the exploration of the garden and the well, and then we end with the well, and using it. So everything kind of comes full circle, and every everything that's set up early in the novel pays off in the end. And I think the the concept of like setups and payoffs is a really important thing to think about when writing, and how Gaiman he seeds all these things early, and then they all come to fruition by the end. Um, and I think that's a really uh, satisfying way to write, and I think I find that I like that in this in the, in his writing and in this novel. Um, it's something he's talked about in the past how he he will often this is an aside, but um, talking about his his writing style, he'll seed things and he doesn't even know how they're going to pay off, but he's just as as he's writing, he's like constantly seeding things. And then later, as he's getting further on in the novel, he can look back at the beginning and look for things that he seeded and go, oh, yeah, I did say this one thing. This can pay off this way. Right. And so then he finds those things and he finds ways to make them pay off. Um, and this is a way to write in which doesn't involve, cause from, as far as I understand, he doesn't outline. He's more of a discovery writer. And this is a way to, this is a way to do it. You, you seed these things and then you make them pay off and then it looks like you've always had it planned. Um, but then what you what you can then do is go back and cut if you had all the if you had some seeds that didn't go anywhere you just cut those when you're revising and so then it'll all look cohesive and look like you planned it from the beginning makes a lot of sense um that's that's what Miyazaki does a lot of the time is is like he doesn't know where it's going to end up he doesn't know where the story's going to end up and I feel I I personally don't think that I could write that way but I think that's fascinating and maybe that's the sign of like some sort of master storyteller who can... I don't know that any one way is better than another, but I, I do feel like I write that way because I'm, I'm not someone who... Yeah, I don't outline. Um, I will sometimes know the ending um, in a vague sense, so I'll kind of have a general idea of like where it's going, but I don't know how it gets there. And then I do find that, that, that when I read that description of like seeding things that then pay off, that's exactly something I feel like I do a lot. 
I set up things that I then like store in the back of my head and go, oh, I, I set up this thing earlier. Now it needs to pay off. Now it needs to pay off. So I, I do feel like that when I read that applied to how I like to write. So I've always kind of held on to that because it was like, oh, someone who someone who talks about it in a way that makes sense to me, because that's what you got to do with writing. You got to find something that makes sense to you. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of great writers like Brandon Sanderson meticulously outlines every scene in his not in his monster novels. Um, and so there are writers who who can who can make great work and who can who can really deliver who do it different ways. Yeah. But I think it's important just to find something that makes sense for you. Yeah, I think for me it would be more of an outline. I lo- there's a, there's another couple lines here that I just want to call out. Um, the other the, when she comes back into her real world, she says the sky had never seemed seemed so sky, the world had never seemed so world. I thought that was and interesting. Yeah. Again, it's just like it's so simple, but it's so cool. Like it's it's and it means it means so much in this moment to her. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that he says the other mother's skin was pale like a spider's belly. Which I don't know that spider bellies are pale. I don't, like I don't know, but the the description is just so cool because it's so evocative and it, and it's it's deliberate because I think there's a lot of comparisons between her and a spider that get made. Um, her hand is very spider like. Uh, yeah, comes I was off. gonna say in the film, I think that it she is somewhat becomes like spider a spider. I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, she's kind of like weaving this world together. So you Mm -hmm. you can definitely think about like a web and you can think about a spider. And then, you know, I make connections to it. So (laughs) Um, it's like it's funny how a lot of these things keep coming back. Right. I did notice that when she was coming through the tunnel, there was a sense of like something else being there that wasn't the other mother. It was this other thing. And it was older than the other mother. Is it the turtle? Is it the? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I want to. What did you? What did you make of that? Like, is that just? Is that maybe that's extended universe stuff, right? Yeah, For I Damon. don't. I don't know. I don't think I. I don't know. I don't think I looked that far into it. I felt like now that you're saying it, it does feel like there's another power at play, like some like some sort of guiding f- hand of fate or something. But I felt like it was mostly just her the Bill Dame's power to create a portal, bring you in, lure you in, trick you into staying. Because she created yeah, the world. He, he, like she, she talked about it like it was a separate entity, though. Yeah. From the belt, from the Beldame or Beldam or whatever her name was. Yeah. I don't know, man. And, and to me, like, yeah, I'm wondering if this is this is like extended universe stuff. <laughs> people, people, if you know game and stuff, let us know. The only other thing I wanted to mention was I liked the end where um, Mr. What's his name? Mr. Bobo. Mr. Bobo, yeah. He says that the the mice have, have said that she saved the day and that they want her to come to their first show and, and all I just thought that was a cool way to wrap it and for a children's novel to end that way. Um and to, for her to be seen as a hero. Like 'cause 'cause her parents don't know and really the, the nobody knows, but the mice for some reason these the animals have some sort of perception, I guess. They're able to to perceive certain things and realize that she saved the day, even though the human I also don't. like that we don't get we don't get a scene of her watching the nice the mice playing their instruments in the real world, right? No, we don't need that. Instead yeah. we get her hearing music that she says must be coming from tiny instruments. And she like makes the leap that that's what she's hearing. But she could just as easily be hearing like a record playing or something, right? Like it doesn't have to be that. So I like the idea that like as crazy and like fantasy strong a lot of the stuff that happens in the other world is, the the real world, quote unquote, like still has like rules to it that's recognizable. It's still recognizably our world. Um, so yeah, I like that. Like it's there's a certain consistency there that makes me like bo- make, makes me want to believe this novel. Um, I also, it's interesting how she returns the stone to the women at the end. I also think that's that's kind of a cool touch. Like she, she says, "I'm done with it now." You know, I don't need it anymore. And she returns it to them, and that goes against, I think, what a lot of like. I guess it also um, sign- signals that the story is truly over, because if she yeah. held on to that stone, you could feel like there's more story to tell. Well, I her think returning it is like it, the story is truly over. I also feel like it might be her returning it is like next time another kid needs it. Hopefully that they can come to you and, you know, pick it up and fight back against her because it's like she's not. Yeah, she's she could come back. Well, and there's like a respect there, too. Like it's it's this isn't mine. This is just something you loaned me. Um, she doesn't take ownership of it. Um, so so I like that, too. That reminds me of Miyazaki. It's very like in touch with the natural world and like not feeling like you have control over things right and that it's it's that you know you're just a part of a larger larger picture 
Um, it's not it's not like human centric thinking. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't know. I like that too. All right, so I think that's going to be it for the book. Um, I'm excited to come back next week. It sounds like we got a lot to talk about with this movie, and I'm excited to see what uh, what differences and similarities there are. Yeah, I can't wait. And it, it's been fun to read, read Neil Gaiman, and I'm glad. I hope that we can revisit it again soon. Yeah, I think we will. Uh, but I wanted to shout out and say thank you to our patrons who voted for this project. I know it came down to a tie between Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe in this, um, which we do plan to do eventually. Um, but this ended up winning out when we took it to Twitter. But I just want to thank the patrons for participating in that vote. That's definitely something we want to lean on our patrons to do. Um, and if you want to find out how you can be a part of that, go to patreon.com forward slash ink to film. Also, if you want to connect with us, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all of those at ink to film. Uh, so send us a message on there. Anything that you see that's ink to film related, send our way and maybe we'll cover it in the future. Also, uh, if you wanted to send any sort of feedback about the episodes or anything that you feel like wasn't touched on in the episode. Or let us know about Neil Gaiman's ex- extended universe. You can send that to ink to film at gmail.com. Yeah, and I, uh, I've i been adding, I've been uh, on Instagram more and more lately. I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying that, putting up photos of whether it's from the, you know, the novels we're reading or of our space we're recording in and, and that kind of stuff. So definitely check us out on Instagram. It's been a lot of fun over there. Another way you can support the podcast uh, that costs no money at all is to leave us a rating and a review on iTunes specifically. Uh, That's the biggest one, and we're at 40 reviews. Thank you so much for leaving them, but I really want to get to 50. That's just been a goal that I set early on that we're getting closer and closer to. So if you've been waiting to do it, please just take a second, leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. I would greatly appreciate it. We wanted to thank Audible for giving us that affiliate link. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film. And with that, you can get any free novel in their collection. Also, thank you to Ross Bugden for the use of our intro and outro music. Okay, man. Uh, I'm going to see you again next week when we, when we talk Coraline film. Until then, I'm Luke. And I'm James. See ya. See ya.